on the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting, we are never alone. Hello, Edgewater. Pastor Dan here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here online today as we uh, continue through our time of Advent. Uh, just a reminder that we uh, have lots of different worship opportunities available, uh, both here online and our regular service times, including our traditional service at 8 o'clock. Uh, we also have... Um, our outside services on Saturday evenings uh, at 6 o'clock at both the Port Charlotte and the North Port campuses. Uh, we also have Sunday morning worship is in person uh, at 9 and 11 at the Port Charlotte campus and at 11.20 in North Port. And then also don't forget we're having Christmas Eve services as well. Uh, be sure to check out those times and, and those are going to be outdoors and it's going to be a, a really special time. So please be sure to put all of that on your calendar. Um, all right, well, we are in uh, part three of a four-week message series called God With Us. And uh, we're just going to jump right in, start with the verse that we've been starting with in all of the, uh, the, the weeks so far, and that's Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where it says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So in this series, we're talking about the presence of God in different seasons of our lives, different situations and circumstances that are going on, uh, because we all experience God in, in different ways based kind of on what's going on in our life experience at the time. So uh, in the first week, we talked about uh, God in the valleys. Uh, we learned the key principle that we may enjoy God on the mountaintops, but we get to know him intimately in the valleys. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, God in the wilderness. God often whispers in the wilderness. And why, why does God whisper? He whispers because he's close. And we learned the valuable principle that our deepest need becomes a gift when it drives us to depend on God. So even those difficult life circumstances, those things that we struggle with, it can be a gift because if, if then it helps us to learn to depend on God even more. So today what I want to do is I want to talk about God's presence in the storms. Because honestly, here's the reality of life. You're either coming out of a storm, or you're in the middle of a storm, or you're headed into a storm. In other words, life can be really difficult. I know it's not an encouraging way to start off the, the sermon today, but it's true. It seems like you're either coming out of a difficult time, you're in the middle of one, or there, there's one around the corner that you may or may not even see coming. Because there are, there are painful and difficult things that happen in the world. So where is God with you in the midst of a storm? Uh, being in Florida, we know, we know all about storms. Uh, we had a wild hurricane season this year. Uh, we even got to the, to the Greek alphabet names uh, for, for storms. Um, to me, it's always been a little strange that, uh, that we name killer storms after the names of people. Um, I, and actually, I, I looked it up and I noticed that the, the fourth storm of next year is slated to be Hurricane Danny. So uh, I'm hoping that one stay, stays out to sea. Um, I'm glad that we don't just make everyday events and, and name them after people's names. Think about it. If you, if you couldn't make it into work one day and you started naming your excuses why you couldn't make it to work. Uh, yeah, boss, I couldn't come in today because of, because of Hangover Howie. You know, he just took me out. It was like a Category 4. It was awful. It was ridiculous. I couldn't be there. Oh, I, I got hit on the way in. Flat tire Fran, you know. Woo, she was bad. Had to wait for AAA and everything. But they, they didn't used to name the storms after people. Um, they, they used to name it after geographic places. And then in 1953, it was the first year that U.S. meteorologists started naming storms actually after their, their wives and girlfriends. And that's kind of stupid if you think about it. 
because, you know, imagine I'm a meteorologist and, and I come home and I'm like, hey, Shaney, there's this Category 5 storm. It's going to kill a lot of people, just leave tons of damage. Reminded me of you. I call her Hurricane Shaney. <laughs> Don't you feel loved? Don't you feel happy about that? Man, what in the world were they thinking? So, so for 25 years then, they named storms after females. And then in, in 1979, there was an equal rights for storms and they started to name after men as well. And uh, as, you, as you probably know, uh, if there's a particularly bad storm, they retire that name and never, ever use it again. So there's your little history lesson for the day on naming storms. Um, unfortunately, some of you are in a storm right now that you might be tempted to name. Man, you know, I, I just, I, I wish I could get through storm divorce. I wish I could get through storm depression. I wish I could get through this financial storm. I wish I could get through this relational storm, whatever it is. Sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of real pain and we just want the storm to go away. What do you do when you're in the middle of a storm? Unfortunately, a lot of people, when it comes to God, they'll often blame God for the storm. Or or they'll question, where is God? Or even, why is God allowing this? I don't understand where God is in this storm. Well, our key thought for today is this. Is that never allow the presence of a storm to cause you to doubt the presence of God. Never allow the presence of a storm to cause you to doubt the presence of God. I want to look today at Acts chapter 27, and we're going to spend a lot of time there today. Uh, We're going to look at some men who are on board a ship in the middle of a massive, crazy storm. This storm went on for several days. The crew was so terrified, they they started throwing cargo overboard. They thought for sure the storm was going to take them out. Uh, This this was a storm that they thought that they would not survive. So we pick up the story in Acts chapter 27, verse 20, where it says, The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars, until at last all hope was gone. That phrase kind of gets to me a little bit because I talk to people all the time that have just given up hope. They've given up all hope. Hey, there's just no way our marriage is going to make it. There's no way we'll ever climb out of this financial debt. There's no way we're going to beat this cancer. I'm going to be alone for my whole life. We're we're never going to be able to conceive. After what happened, I'm never going to be able to afford to graduate from college. I'm never going to be free of this addiction. They've, They've given up all hope. The storm just continued to rage, and they gave up all hope. Verse 21 says, No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. I'm sure there were quite a few folks who really just wanted to punch Paul in the nose right about then. Um, But here's the thing. Paul was a regular guy. I know we kind of... Uh, elevate him because he wrote so much of the the, the New Testament and, and did so much for the early church. But Paul was just a regular guy, as spiritual as he was. He wasn't above doing what so many of us love to do, uh, which is when you're right, telling people, I told you so. If you had just listened to my advice, you wouldn't be in the middle of the storm. Why, why were they in the storm? Well, it was, they were in the storm because it was their fault, because they made the decision to go when, when the environment and circumstances were risky. Have you ever noticed that sometimes in, in Christian environments, so many people just love to blame the devil for everything? Oh, it's the devil's fault. It's the devil's fault. The devil did this. The devil made me do it. Now, some, sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it's your own dumb fault. Sometimes it's my own dumb fault. Sometimes you're in the middle of a storm because you, you spent too much money. Sometimes you're in the middle of a storm because your emotions got the best of you and you said something that you probably shouldn't have said. Sometimes you're in the middle of a storm because you procrastinated and put off doing what you needed to do. It's not the devil's fault that you didn't pass your final exam. It's your fault for eating Domino's pizza and drinking beer too late until the night and waiting until the very end to study. Sometimes you're in a storm because everybody else told you not to date him. Your mama told you not to date him. Your daddy told you not to date him. Your pastor told you not to date him. Your best friend told you not to date him. Your fortune cookie told you not to date him. And you argue back, but he's got so much potential. He's got so much potential. Yeah, he's got the potential to ruin your life. But you dated him anyway. Sometimes you're in the middle of a storm 
because it's just your own fault. Maybe, maybe that's why they gave up hope, because it was their own fault. I don't know about you, but it's easier for me to believe that God will get me out of a storm when God got me into the storm more than it is for me to believe that God will get me out of a storm that I just ran myself into. That this is my fault. I don't even deserve to be rescued because it was my, my bad decision. So the storm continued to rage and they gave up all hope. Um, now, there were other people on the boat and it, it probably wasn't their fault that they were in the storm. I don't know how big the, the crew was, but there, there were probably a few people in the crew that said, hey, Paul's saying we shouldn't go, so maybe we shouldn't go. But the captain said go. And so they all ended up here, and they're all together in the middle of the storm. And for some of them, it wasn't, it wasn't their fault. Have you ever been in the middle of a storm, and it wasn't your fault? You know, sometimes as a kid, your parents, they end up divorcing, and you're in the middle of a storm that wasn't your fault. Your company made all sorts of bad decisions, and they ended up having to downsize, and your job was a casualty of that. And you're in a storm that wasn't your fault. You trusted somebody. They gave their word. You believed them. You thought that they would do what they said they would do, and, and they didn't deliver. And now, again, you're in a storm, and it wasn't your fault. Whatever the case may be, in the middle of a storm, sometimes it is just it's easy to give up hope. So the storm continued to rage, and they gave up all hope. But again, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. And so this is what Paul says in the first part of verse 22. He says, but take courage. But take courage. I, I want to say this to some of you who need to hear this. But take courage. Keep your faith. The storm isn't going to take you down. Let's look at uh, verse 22 and 23. Where it says, but take courage, none of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night an angel of, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. You may not be aware, but there are angels even in this room right now. I believe with all my heart that there are things that we see with physical eyes, but what we see with physical eyes is not all that there is. That there's a spiritual world that goes beyond what we have the ability to see. And that there's a spiritual battle going on all around us all the time. In fact, right now there could be some, some pretty big angels hanging out behind me. I don't know. That would be pretty cool. But, but imagine that you're in the middle of a storm and the, and the presence of God is with you in this moment. You have no ideas no idea all the different ways that God is with you. He could be there with you in the form of a supernatural being, an, a, an angel. He's, he's with you in the form of his spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus, his spirit dwells within you. He goes before you. Our, our God is already in tomorrow. God is not constrained by time. He, he is hearing your prayers. He's comforting you in your hurts. He's directing you in your loss. You have no idea all of the different ways that God is with you in the presence of the storm. So Paul said, an angel of the Lord stood beside me in the middle of the storm. Again, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. And so this is what Paul told Timothy later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. It says, the first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. Some of you, you need to hear this. You need to be reminded of this again. That, that in what you're going through right now, God has not left you. God has not left you. He is still with you at your side. He's still giving you strength. David said this in the Old Testament. He said, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, uh, for he's right beside me. It's all about who's beside you, who's with you. When you realize that God is with you, it changes your posture. It changes your mood. It builds your faith. It redirects your mindset. It's all about who's with you. When you recognize that even though you're in the middle of the presence of a storm, that God is right beside by you. He is with you. He's strengthening you. And, and when you realize that, it, it kind of changes how you ride out the storm. 
It's all about who's in the boat with you in the middle of the storm. In fact, in the New Testament, there's a powerful story about the disciples being in, in a different boat in a different storm. And uh, what's funny about this one is Jesus is with them, but he's actually asleep in the boat. And, and the disciples did what we so often do in the middle of a storm. They, they freaked out. They were like, this isn't fair. We're going to die. Jesus, where are you? Why don't you care? Aren't you going to do anything? Man, this isn't good. I don't, I don't like this. What's going to happen? And Jesus wakes up. And he says, why are you so afraid? You have little faith. And he says, peace, be still. And they experienced peace in the boat. Why did they experience peace in the boat? Because Jesus was on the boat. Real peace is not found in the absence of a storm. Peace is found in the presence of Jesus. Real peace isn't found in a, in a trouble-free life because the reality is none of us is ever going to have a trouble-free life. Following Jesus does not mean that bad things are not going to happen. It's, it's bad theology to think that that's true. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's a promise from Jesus. But he goes on and says, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. Real peace is not found in the absence of trouble. Real peace is found in the presence of Jesus. He is, he is with me. He's beside me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. Well, let's look at more of the story here in uh, verses 23 and 24. It says, For last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me, and he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. In other words, you aren't going to go down in this battle, Paul, because God has more battles for you to fight. Again, maybe, maybe you need to hear this today. That you're not going to go down in this battle that you're facing because God has some more for you to do. He's not finished with you yet. If you're not dead, you're not done. God has more people for you to love. He has more opportunities for you to serve. He's got more times that he's calling you to be a blessing to people around you. You're not going down in this storm, whatever it is you're facing. The ship may go down, but this storm is not going to take you out. In fact, God will, will use what you learn in this storm to help to prepare you to help others through their storms. I, I, love, I love how this works in, in kind of the, the, the God circumstances. That there's a purpose in the storm. The, the storm you're facing did not surprise God. He's doing something in you. He's speaking to you. He's strengthening you. He's deepening your roots. And he will use what you learn in the midst of your storm to, to someday help somebody else through theirs. One day you'll say, you know, I've been through a storm just like that. We survived unfaithfulness in our marriage, and you can as well. We overcame financial hardship. And we did what was right, and we climbed out of debt. You can climb out of debt too. You can say, I used to be in bondage to this or that, but by the grace of Jesus, he set me free, and the same Jesus that set me free can set you free. That's what Celebrate Recovery is all about here on Monday nights. We get to be encouraged and inspired by people who have gone through many of the storms that we're going through, and, and they've made it through to the other side. And we get to hear that it's possible to survive. You get to see how it's possible to grow through it all. That God is, God is doing something. God is working in you. And you don't always know it when you're in the midst of the storm. But on the other side of the storm, when you, when you get safe to shore, and you oftentimes look back and you go, man, I don't ever want to go through that again. I wouldn't want anyone else to, that I know to have to go through that one. But I would never, ever trade it for the, the intimacy and the spiritual depth and the character and the trust and the faith in God that is a result of being in that storm. This is how I've learned. This is how I've grown. And it wouldn't have happened had there not been a storm. Verse 25 then says, So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. I have faith in God that it's going to happen. My faith is not in what I see. 
My faith is in what God says. I have faith in God that what he says will come to pass. I have faith in God that it will happen. My faith is not in the boat. My faith is in the one who commands the wind and the waves. My faith is not in this, in this ship, but my faith is on the one who created the trees that made the ship. I have faith in my God that it will happen, that he will see us through, that he will be my deliverance, that he will provide, that my God will bring healing, that in the middle of the storm I will experience his peace. I have faith in God that it will happen. Because here's the bottom line. You can't control when a storm blows up. You can't control how severe the storm is. You can't control how long the storm lasts. You can't control what people say about you while you're in the midst of a storm. You can't control what people do to you, but you can control what you believe. You can control where you put your faith. You can control how you respond to it. My faith is in the one who created the wind and the waves. My faith is in God. I have faith in God that what he says will come to pass. What he says will happen. So who is God? The psalmist in Psalm 46, 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. So we can say it this way. Even if I lose my job, even if the relationship does fall apart, even if the economy gets shaky, I will not be afraid. Why? Because he is with me, because he will never leave me, because he will not forsake me, because he is what I need, because he is my safety, because he is my strength, he is my comforter, he is my source, he is my redeemer, because he is my righteousness, he is my friend that sticks closer than a brother, because he is my rock, because he is my bread of life, he is the living water that satisfies my soul, he is the gate through which I enter, he is the guide who directs my step, he is my comforter that ministers to me in my time of need, he is my Peace. Peace is not found in the absence of a storm. Peace is found in the presence of Jesus. And he is with me. Look, the virgin will be with child and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And that's why you never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. True peace isn't found in the absence of storms and trials and troubles because that's just part of life. True peace is found in the presence of Emmanuel, God with us. My faith is not in what I see. My faith is in what God says. And God says it's going to happen. The storm will not take you down. Be at peace. God is with you. Please pray with me. God, thank you so much for this time today. I thank you for your presence in the midst of the storms. Because God, sometimes those storms, it it can be a a little sprinkle, but sometimes those storms can feel like a, a Category 5 hurricane. But God, we thank you that even though these things inevitably come our way, we thank you that you are with us. That your presence is right there, that you are our shelter that you are the one who sustains, that you tell us this storm is not going to take us out because you still have more for us to do. You still have more ways that um, you want to use us. So God, help us to learn what it is that you want us to learn in the midst of the storm, that we can grow, that we can develop a deeper relationship with you through it all, that we could depend on you more and more, that you'll grow our character that you'll, you'll walk with us closely. Maybe, uh, maybe you're here today and you've been weathering these storms all on your own and you, you just feel like you've been uh, tossed at sea and, and maybe you're at that point that we talked about earlier that you've just lost all hope. Maybe you've never um, experienced God's presence with you because you've never taken that time to Turn your life over to him, to follow him, to invite him into the boat of your life. Well, we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. That he, be, he can become your, your peace in the midst of the storms. That he can 
give your, him your presence, that he can give his presence to you even in the midst of whatever it is that you're going through. And so we want to give you an opportunity to respond to that, to, to say yes, to start following Jesus, to invite him in. And one of the ways that we do that around here is through a simple prayer. So I'm going to pray this prayer, and I invite you to uh, repeat it after me, phrase by phrase. And pray, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me for all I've done wrong. Help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.